So, Danny, I'm, I'm going to take you back first. Okay. So, I know you've been here on the force, you said, 23 years. Mm -hmm. How'd you grow up, though? Oh, wow. So, um, I'm definitely born and bred Detroit native. Um, I came up in the house, I'm the eldest of four. Um, both of my parents were functioning drug addicts. Um, however, that, that didn't stop anything, you know. Um, they took care of business. They made sure, you know, food was on the table. I've been in a uniform my whole life because there was always a private school or a charter school. Um, I graduated at the age of 16 from Dominican. Wow. Yeah, so, you know, it's a lifelong, I guess, kind of a mantra of mine, you know, your circumstances don't have to define your future. Um, came on the job very early and I signed up on a dare. Uh, I had no intentions in being a police. I wanted to actually be a hairstylist. So <laughs> even though I didn't do this here, but um, yeah, just a very spiritual person. And I know that I've always been surrounded by angels and clearly this has been uh, destined for me because I believe everything is in divine order and yes here so, I am. So I want to ask you, so, so I don't know anything about your history but I do want to, I want you to tell me your history like some of your challenges growing up, I know you just said your mm -hmm. mom and dad were functioning drug addicts, I certainly mm -hmm. understand that. Um, in, in the terms of the gay community and especially growing up in Detroit, when did that come into play in your life? So uh, and anything you don't want to talk about, you just say, Carolyn, I don't want to talk about that. No, I'm, no, I'm, I'm fine. Um, so I can remember back to maybe age seven or eight, um, liking girls. It was nothing that, uh, you know, I sought out. I just, that's where my attention went. And um, I didn't know if it was right or wrong, but this was always, you know, this girl, you know, or girls just throughout my uh, childhood, you know, these were my special friends and I held them to a different, I just had a different love for them. Um, but as I grew older and you kind of find out the talks and the rights and the wrongs, um, I felt like it was wrong. And so uh, I did what every closeted person does and they have a boyfriend, you know, or someone of the opposite sex. And uh, I never claim to hate men or, or guys or nothing like that. That's never been a thing for me. However, um, I just didn't know how to navigate it and be honest with myself about my own um, orientation. And so it wasn't until <laughs> uh, my mother sent me to Dominican which was the uh, last all-girl Catholic high school in the city, um, that I realized who I was. And uh, came out to my mother, and that was uh, a very interesting conversation because it was nothing that I was forthcoming about. Um, it was a spat that my girlfriend and I were having at the time. And this is back in the caller ID days, the little white box. And she was calling and hanging up and we were having this back and forth. And my mother sat me down, what's going on? And so I told her and she said, I already knew. I was just waiting on you to tell me. So, so that's, that's a positive thing. That's a very positive thing. We'll be thrown out the house mm -hmm. or people are in denial. Mm -hmm. So yeah. your mom was. Oh, my parents are very accepting and loving and non-judgmental and we've uh, always been close and had a dynamic bond. You know, my sibling is, siblings and I are very tight. Um, I'm, of course, the oldest is always the second mom and, you know, I'm my mother's uh, rider. You know, we've been through the trenches together and even with my dad, um, who's passed on now, but, um, I was blessed to have a second dad, you know, my papa, and he's been in my life since I was 11 years old. So 
the family dynamic is there, you know, uh, it's a little chaotic at times. However, um, it never took over the love and the care and the attention that my siblings and I needed. So then, so that's beautiful, because that's not always the story. I, I mean, I remember members of my own family trying to come out and how certain family mm -hmm. members reacted and how mm -hmm. others reacted. So with you then, um, you learned about it, told your mom about it when you were in high school. Mm -hmm. So navigating the police force, ha, that's so. got to be a, a different, or, or maybe not. Well, um, definitely because I wasn't out, out, you know, like I told my mom because I had a girlfriend at the time and um, to myself, I didn't know if I was going through a phase or not because I never said, mom, I'm gay. I just said, this is my girlfriend. And, um, you know, I, I dated guys. I kind of went back and forth because I didn't know I didn't know my own truth and then even with that um, I just was just trying to figure things out and so it wasn't until um, I started dating my wife that it just set in wholeheartedly this is it um, because I was engaged to a male before and that relationship was just very, um, very toxic. And um, I had just, I didn't want to date anybody. I didn't want to do anything, you know, and I prayed about it. And the Lord sent me my wife. Um, but even by that time, there was no liaison. There was no nothing. And her and I started dating in 2006. We got married in 2008. Still no liaison. Now you were telling me about a specific situation mm -hmm. that you went through that made you feel that there needed to be a voice mm -hmm. for people here on the force. Tell me, tell me what happened. So um, a person I was working with, not my regular partner, um, we received a family trouble disturbance run. And when we get there, um, it was a fight. And it was two young ladies fighting in the front yard of a, a residential home. And one of the uh, ladies was a bit more masculine presenting than the other. And the guy I was working with, he leans over to me and he says, I wonder which one is the man, which was very unsettling to me. Um, however, we had to make sure that they didn't do any more damage to each other. So we handled that run and then uh, came on back to the station. And, you know, I had a conversation with him. Uh, did but he understand? He did, uh, because first I tried to trick him and I said, well, that was my cousin you were talking about. And then the backpedaling became, you know, he began. And then I said, no, not really, but you really have to be careful what you say. And the conversation went from there because it was a little, uh, we'll say colorful. Um, however, uh, he did gain an understanding after that. And um, from there, it was just something in my heart and in my spirit. There needs to be a representative for the gay community. And that's what I thought at the time because I wasn't thinking LGBT and definitely not Q, I had no idea. And so uh, I went to my commander at the time and I presented the position not knowing what I was asking for. And it was still very taboo then, you know, 2006. And he said, well, let me think about it, but we already have community officers. I'm like, I know. And he says, but community is for everybody. I get it, but I think it needs to be someone for the gay community. Well, let me think on it. And so I went back a couple times and we had conversations. However, um, it didn't shift. And so I continued on with my career, as did he. And then he became chief. And uh, I get a phone call one day. My wife and I are actually on the road driving in from out of town. And he's super excited. You know, I'm looking at the phone. Why is the chief calling me? And um, we talk, you know, exchange pleasantries. And then he says, I really think 
you should be the representative, this, this LGBT liaison I heard about in Atlanta. And I go, what is that? And he says, you know, it's an officer that is the representative for the gay community. I said, didn't I ask you about that years ago? <laughs> and we had a good chuckle about it, but I, I was up for the task. And I said, well, what do I have to do? He says, I don't know, we'll figure it out. And then um, due to some administrative changes, it kind of fell on the back burner, but because I'm, you know, I was married to my wife, out in the community, you know, I was a, a go-to person, you know, on the police department if any of our friends or, you know, uh, folks needed any assistance or advice or anything. But then when um, Craig came to Detroit, uh, I hear that that was one of his first orders of business. And I was on a task force with the county at the time, assigned out from criminal investigations, and the task force went belly up. And so then I was back here working in cr criminal investigations, and uh, our assistant chief at the time, he comes down, and he's like, hey kid, that LGBT stuff you're doing, can you do that from anywhere or do you have to be right here? I said, well, I guess I could do it from anywhere. And he says, all right, Monday, you're upstairs in the chief's office. I said, it's Wednesday. Like, do I get time to? Monday, you're upstairs. And even being in his office, I did, still did not know what to do. And he would walk past my desk every day. And then he mentions to my boss, why is Danny at her desk? The community is out there. Why is she at her desk? Huh, so then I get the message. And when he comes back, he says, what have you been doing? I said, as far as what? The liaison. I said, um, I, I go to stuff and you know, I'm, I'm here if they need me. He said, no, call LA, call Cincinnati and call Maine. I created liaisons there, find out what they're doing and uh, get some guidance from there. And get busy. And get busy. And so I said, okay. And I made those calls. However, all they could tell me about was pride. The pride parade? Pride, just or pride month, pride June. Month. And so I said, okay, that's great. But what do you do July through May? And it was a lot of fumble and well, you know, we're around and you know, we do this and do that, but to me, that wasn't enough. And so I said, okay, well, thank you, you know, for your time. And then I go home and I talk to my wife and I'm like, I don't know where to start. I can't disappoint the chief. I don't wanna, you know, be a flub with the position. And so I prayed about it, got up the next day, training. Training is key, right? That's the foundation for everything, training. And so um, I paired up with the local LGBT organization and we decided that they would conduct a training for our training officers, right? Because we want to start with the foundation of the department, which is training. And whatever language the officers didn't understand, I would translate it, right, to LGBT and back and forth. And this was the worst experience ever. Was it? Yeah. The training? The training was Why? terrible because um, the presenters were uh, very biased in their um, instruction. It wasn't wrong, however, when you talk at people and not to them, they're not gonna be so uh, receptive. receptive. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of it was kind of rough, and it's a lot of information to take in okay. at once. And so from there, I go home, and I'm like, it was a disaster. You know what I'm telling my wife? And she says, well, why don't you create your own? Create my own training? I have no idea where to start, what to do. And she says, you'll figure it out. And I did. I went to... Uh, 
community events. I hosted community events. I talked to the community. I asked them what did they want from their police department? What do you need from your police department? What has been your experience? And then I lumped that with some other wonderful ingredients and um, sent it to our training unit, who in turn, we sent it to MCOLS, which is our uh, Michigan Commission on Training, and they approved it. And it is the only LGBT sensitivity, awareness and competency training in the state. Wow, mm -hmm. and when did you enact that? That was maybe in 2015. 2015, well that 2014. was 2014. Mm -hmm. Quite a, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And the, it's still the only one in the state? Well, some some departments have a modified version or they um, tack it into their uh, uh, cultural diversity training, mm -hmm. but it's not as extensive as mine. So then tell me this, tell me what kind of difference have you made because you know when we do stories on the news and you hear about transgender people being mm -hmm. attacked or um, you know kids committing suicide. I just saw a young kid, not here, um, but a kid who might have been transgender mm -hmm. but committed suicide. You know, what have you done, you know, to make a difference there in our community? Or did you feel that that needed to be tackled? Uh, absolutely. So it has been um, an uphill battle for sure. You know, it was a very rocky start because of the history mm -hmm. between the LGBTQ plus community and law enforcement. However, um, giving the community the space to express themselves and also um, a voice to say, this is how it was, this is how we needed to be. And then being a part of the community myself, what do I want? And so I'm, I'm taking all these elements and implementing them. And then when you have the support of the mayor's office, the police department, your partners, you know, partners and coworkers, your family, and this push for change, it creates a dynamic um, voice all in of itself. And so the, the visibility and the intentionality that the community sees from the department, from the police specifically here, they have kind of broken down their walls a little bit and have began to trust a bit more than they once did. And the fact that the officers are trained and they know how to better interact with people. They're learning the terminology, they're learning about pronouns. And so rather than shy away because they don't understand, no, they can welcome this person and interact and get them the, the assistance that they need. And two, other folks just seeing the work being done, other identifying LGBTQ members and they want to be the police. And so they come on the job and we have all this representation and the visibility is, is paramount. I'm not claiming perfection, you know, we're not saying that. However, just the inclusiveness that we have on this department has, um, I guess, just spoke volumes and told the community, you're welcome here. And then even in combating crime, you know, we're not shying away from those incidents that we once did, excuse me, because we're all human beings before anything else and we're public servants. And so if a human being needs the assistance of a public servant, no matter what your orientation is, your identity is, that's what we're here to do. And working with the community, like um, prime example, Fair Michigan, um, their director of trans advocacy, Jaleesa, is phenomenal. We work hand in hand with a lot of things and she's the court, I'm the law enforcement, and you know, working with the detectives and investigators and really honing in to create justice, you know, to give folks closure, you know, and that's not to uh, diminish anybody else's work. That's just an example of coming up through, you know, grassroots advocacy and getting to where we are now. So what would you say to that seven-year-old little girl 
and what you're doing now. If you could see that little seven-year-old unsure girl, or maybe you weren't so unsure because you didn't really know what you were doing then, mm -hmm. but you know, to think that there are other little girls mm -hmm. and other women mm -hmm. and other people in your community who will see you and be so proud that you've made so many strides. What's, what's your message to all of those people? I would give them a hug and I would tell them it's okay. We're in a different time now. You can be yourself. It's okay. You feel safer? I do. I do. Um, I still fear for um, other identities, though, because everyone does not have it um, as easy, because there are so many different layers to identities and orientations and presentations mm -hmm. and expressions of those things. And so, um, it's, it's scary. It's scary for some um, and easier for others, you know, and I think that's probably with every demographic, ethnicity, race, you know, but um, I still fear for our tra trans women, specifically our trans women of color, um, our gay and queer men, um, our non-binary people, like I, I fear for them because a lot of people don't understand and they're quick to judge and they don't look at the human being. They try to figure out the person and it's, it's tough. And having those conversations, like I've even started, I'm no therapist, but uh, I'm a people person and I'm a compassionate person. And I started doing uh, mediation for families because uh, there are a lot of parents that don't understand. They want to, but they don't get it. And if I can provide that understanding, you know, or even for the child who is acting out because they feel like their parents are supportive, you know, it's, it's two sides. And so I've, I've been able to be that bridge and that connection to, I guess, give this family the bond that they once had. Very proud of that work. You know, it's another element, but I don't mind because I'm serious about what I do. So I just have a couple more questions, John. You may have any, a few, but I want to ask you this. Um, when we go down the list of, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't understand all of the letters. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? I, how, how do you educate the community? How do we get a better understanding? Of course, I understand being a lesbian and being gay and being bi and transgender. But then when you get to queer or non-binary, mm -hmm. am I saying that right? Mm -hmm. Or the other ones, how do we get a better understanding in the community? Um, well, first, and I, I, I know I keep saying this, um, the first thing is your initial interaction. Mm -hmm. You know, because there are different pronouns and identities, um, I think it's, easier to ask a person how they prefer to be addressed. How do you prefer to be addressed? Just like uh, you all ask, say your name, give your title, you know, um, if you notice in some signature blocks now, people will have their pronouns. And this is helpful to give the person you're uh, interacting with um, some insight as to who you are, and, you know, even if it's just a, a pronoun, she, her, or they, them. Um, it's, I guess, just being respectful of the person, and that's the thing that I, I really try to hone in on. We are all human beings, and to respect the person, you know, who cares how they present or how they choose to live their life behind closed doors that has nothing to do with you you know, but you make it your business to make their business yours. And that is a responsibility you need not take on, you know, but asking a person how uh, they prefer to be addressed is definitely um, a one way. Uh, what are your pronouns? You know, do you have a preferred name? Those are, you know, questions that are not offensive. Those are questions that will be appreciated so then the person doesn't have to educate you, you know, because that becomes a thing. Okay. 
And then, okay, then I want to ask you one other question. What do you say to young people who, you know, um, and, and I'm not trying to be offensive, but mm -hmm. I want to learn from you and understand you as a community liaison. You know, when we see young people who feel free today, you know, you might see, I don't know, a they, them, he, she, I don't, I don't know the pronouns, but you know, say you pull up to Wendy's and someone who looks like a young man might have nails, might have colorful hair, how do we teach the community just to understand, um, not to be offensive, not to be judgmental? I'm sure you talk about those kinds mm -hmm. of things because so many people are free now. Yeah. With how they look, how they dress, how they how they prefer to look. So mm -hmm. in the community, I guess I'm in this story because you're the community community liaison. Do you talk to people about things like that? I I do because guess what, I mess up. Even I mess up, and it's not intentional. You know, there are not a lot of people um, intentionally being malicious, you know, in, in trying to address a person. However, there is an automatic defensive wall that comes up, you're attacking me. And that's not always the case. And so I always tell people the same grace that you require extend that because you just don't everybody doesn't know you know I don't walk up to people and go hi I'm gay Danny how are you you know what I mean and I've had people tell well you don't look gay I say oh please show me a picture where there is a standard look you know you don't know you don't know but the same grace that you uh, expect you should probably extend that as well. Um, and we're not gonna get it right all the time anyway, you know, but when we all operate in, in good faith and with good intentions, you know, just give people a chance. And then my last question, John, unless you have one, does it help when um, there are women in Hollywood, for instance, who come out and say, listen, I'm this or I'm that, or, you know, accept me for who I am, does that help? Um, I think that the in it's in it, I think that the entertainment industry um, has a big voice on um, giving people the power to be themselves. Um, it didn't do it for me, you know, but uh, for some, uh, it's definitely encouraging, you know, because if you look at this is where this person is and this is who they are. That could be me one day. And I think the same could be said of our local children, you know, when they see us at events or um, just, you know, operating in our truth, in uniform and out loud and proud, they go, wow, if she can do it, I can do it too. And did I, did I miss anything? Anything else you wanna add about you or anything else you wanna say? You know what I mean? Like especially because it's 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 women's history month. Um well I do want to say that um through the different administrations everyone, you know, ranking officers, uh non ranking officers have always been supportive. Even if they don't agree, they have been supportive. Um, I'm grateful to the chief, our current chief now, that has been um, so supportive in allowing me to continue to flourish and continue to educate and seize the need for us to um, make changes within our department to ensure that we're covering all the bases. Um, I couldn't be more grateful than my immediate crew um, because they really lift me up. You know, my family, my wife, it's just an amazing feeling to know that you have the support and that's what keeps me pushing. Then the love from the community, um, their support and definitely their input, you know, good, bad or indifferent, they're gonna let me know, but I appreciate it. I appreciate it because this is how we create and affect change, so. It's a beautiful thing. I just have uh, one question, mm -hmm. maybe a two-part, just for Carol, and you can answer it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was your sexuality, uh, 
how, was it hard being a police officer with your sexuality in the beginning or even now? And how has your liaison activity improved relationships out there? Okay, so I don't think that my sexuality had um, anything to do with my performance as an officer. Um, I was not um, all the way out you know, if you will, uh, before I started dating my wife and I had been on a job maybe uh, six years prior to us dating and uh, just getting to know the officers and I've worked at a lot of units where um, I got to know a lot of the members and they got to know me first. And so um, when my wife and I started dating, people more so respected our our relationship than anything and uh my wife who was a dynamic detective at homicide uh, before she retired she had a lot of respect and so it was just i don't know they we didn't get a lot of flack you know people understood but we would get the oh okay which is hilarious to us um but it did not stop anything, if anything, it, it bolstered um, my position because this is not just lip service, I'm living the work that I do.